Uh, you have your Bibles. Uh, we're in Judges chapter 6 as we start a new series. Judges chapter 6, starting with verse 1. The Word of God says, The Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and for seven years, for seven years he gave them into the hands of the Midianites. Because of the power of Midian was so oppressive, the Israelites prepared shelters for themselves in mountain clefts, caves, and strongholds. Whenever the Israelites planted their crops, the Midianites, the Amalekites, and other eastern people invaded the country. They camped on the land and ruined the crops all the way to Gaza and did not spare a living thing for Israel, neither sheep nor cattle nor donkeys. They came up with their livestock and their tents like swarms of locusts. It was impossible to count them for their camels. They invaded the land to ravage it. Midian so impoverished the Israelites, they cried out to the Lord for help. Wow, impossible to count them or even their camels. How, is, how many camels can you possibly have? They invaded the land and they ravaged it. They oppressed the Israelites, impoverished them, the point where they finally cried out to the Lord for help. Let us pray. Father, we cry out to help for you now as we live in a world that has been ravaged, ravaged by storms, by wars, by hatred, by fear. And we come to you now and we're crying out for help. Give us a word from your throne. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Let the redeemed say, amen. So a bit of theology here, understanding who God is. The Bible states that Israel had sinned again. This was a pattern. This was very soon after they had been freed from Egyptian bondage. And now they're in their own land. But good things have a difficult time lasting. Isn't that our experience? And we might think they have a difficult time lasting because that's just the way the world is. But often it is our own misdecisions, decisions, our, our, our own failures, our own stubbornness and sometimes rebellious nature that gets in the way. And Israel seems to be getting in their own way. They sinned again against the Lord. Moses is not there to mediate and neither is Joshua. So at this time in Israel, they are dependent on judges. Not too long ago, we had a series on Samson, who was one of the judges during this stretch of time. And so the Israelites did evil in the sight of the Lord, and so he gives them up into the hand of the Midianites for seven years. The point that I want you to understand here is that God will eventually respect your choice. If you don't want to hang, he's a gentleman and he will respect you. If you do not want to be with him, he will not force himself on you. God is not controlling. Now, I know we like to say God is in control, and I know what we mean when we say that. God is in control, meaning that, that there are boundaries, that, that sin will not overrun God's people, that, that there is a limit. And God even, for Satan, says, hey, there's boundaries here. You cannot do this. I know that's what people mean. But we have to understand that God being in control does not mean that he is controlling. He's not forcing people to do his will. He's not making people sin or rebel. God has always respected choice, and we know that from the very beginning of the Bible. In Genesis chapter 3, God respects the choice of Adam and Eve. If you want to vote for a new president, you can and Lucifer was able to convince Adam and Eve, hey, I'm telling you guys, we don't want to go back. I can't take another four years of this. Vote for me. Change you can believe in. Or let's make the garden great again. Whatever his slogan was. He was adamant that he would do a better job than God. And Adam and Eve, they buy it. They are willing to put their trust in Lucifer's campaign. And because of that, the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 5, because of that, death has reigned 
from the time of Adam all the way until the time that we're in now. It's not God's fault. He didn't make it happen. And those of us who want to blame him in these moments and say, but God, you, you could have stopped it. You could have controlled it. If God were to control it, he would no longer be a God of love. If God were to control it, what we give him would no longer be love. This is really important. In order to be in loving relationships, there must be freedom of choice. Do you guys understand that? If you do not have choice, it is not love. God did not create robots. He created you to be smarter than the squirrels or the cows. You are able to think for yourself and choose how you want to live your life. And God respects your choice, even the choice of evil people. So God respects the choice of the, of the Israelites, and he gives them over. Basically, he removes his protective hedge. And you need to understand this. Bad things don't happen when God draws near. Bad things happen when he leaves, when his presence is withdrawn. He says this in Jeremiah, you want freedom from my laws, you want freedom from me? Sure, I'll give you freedom. Freedom to die by war, freedom to die by pestilence, and freedom to die by famine. Freedom from God is always going to give you the freedom to be exposed to all that hell wants to bring your way. The Bible tells us in Revelation that God holds back the winds of strife. Can you imagine if God did not hold back the winds of strife? But one day God will finally say, your will be done. If this is what you want, I respect you. You do you. So when evil happens in this world, when evil is all around us, it is never an act of God. It is never his bowl of judgment, meaning that it comes from heaven. It is simply God withdrawing his presence out of respect. Are you guys understanding this? This is critical. This is critical. This is systematic theology. We must read from Genesis all the way to Revelation to understand what the wrath of God is. We've been studying this in our Wednesday night prayer meeting when we've been uh, in 1 Thessalonians. We just moved into 2 Thessalonians. It is God always letting go. And this is when evil breaks loose. And so the Bible tells us of what's happening in Israel. Because of their apostasy, they're now, they're now understanding what it's like to live under the system and religious governments of other nations, wicked nations, nations that will sacrifice their children in order to appease gods, Na nations that do not believe in an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. I mean, let me tell you something. In the Old Testament, in the, in the Torah, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth is, is merciful. When you look at some of the things that are happening in this world today, can you imagine if that is how we did war? An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth? Many of us would applaud and say, wow, that's gracious. That's not how we do war today, is it? Someone says, you send a missile over here, we'll send 15 over there. Oh, well, if you send 15 over here, we're going to send 40 over there. You send 40 over there, we're going to send 400 over to you. When God gave Moses the law, to an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, it was so that they would learn fairness and never abuse one another not even under the guise of justice. Then Jesus comes around and says, you've heard in the past an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do better. <laughs> if someone strikes you on your cheek, give them the other. Someone does harm to you, right? Bless them. Christ goes beyond that. That's why it's so interesting when I see certain governments that, that claim to be uh, under God's protection under God's leadership. And I'm like, y'all don't even follow your own laws. You don't even follow what your God prescribes. And so Israel is getting a taste of what it's like to live in a world that have no boundaries. Where people can come in, trample over your crops, kill every living thing, even your pet cats and dogs. And so they cry out to the Lord for help. We're sorry, Lord. We failed. We want you back. We thought it would be better without you. We thought we, thought we, 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 we could have everything our hearts ever desired without your restrictions. Now we realize that your laws have been protecting us. Your, your ways have been a boundary. Your love 
has been a shelter. We're sorry. Help us. Aren't you glad the Lord is not like us that can be petty and go, oh, now you want to talk to me? The Lord sometimes has his moments, and, 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 and he does, uh, after, after verse 6, God does go into a little bit of it. We're not going to read it, but God does go into a little bit of a moment of history lessons because God has to remind people of where they're coming from. He says, you remember how I did this, and I did this, and I did that, and you guys rejected me? Okay, I just, I just want to make sure we all know how we got to this point. I'm not being petty. I just need you to know how you got to this point. Why is this important? Because awareness, awareness unlocks our ability to see the truth so that we never go back into the darkness again. That's why I can't take apologies that are like, hey, you know what, if I ever offended you, I'm sorry. No, 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 that's not how it works. You need to know how you offended me. Because if you don't know how you offended me, it's going to happen again. You need to be able to acknowledge what happened that broke this relationship, fractured this trust. That's not to be petty, and that's not to be judgmental, but we must know how we got to this point. If you run out of gas on the freeway, you need to know how you got to that place. Well, I was, I was a little lazy, wasn't paying attention, I was on the phone, whatever it was, so that you don't repeat the same mistakes. Amen? So God is wanting to make sure they understand how they got to this place. And then finally, the angel of the Lord speaks to the one who will be the next judge. We're in verse 11, Judges 6, verse 11 says, The angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak in Ophrah that belonged to Joash, there where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a winepress to keep it from the Midianites. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. An angel of the Lord shows up and calls me out and says, I'm a mighty warrior. How do you all feeling? The Lord were to come up to you and say, hey, you are a mighty princess warrior. That's what I'm talking about. The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Now, it's interesting that when the angel appears to Gideon, he's actually hiding from the enemy. He's actually, he's actually trying to, to, to do work so in, a, in, a, in, in secrecy so the Midianites will not steal what he's producing. He's there threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. It's not typically where you thresh wheat, but that's where he is. And the angel of the Lord says to him, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. This is a very interesting response here, and I, and I, I really want to dissect this for just a little bit here because it's this, this, this speaks to all of our brokenness. Watch his response. The angel of the Lord comes to him for, as an answer to prayer, and his reaction is this. Verse 13, pardon me, my Lord. But if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of Midian. Use your imagination for just a minute here. Um, imagine being in darkness hiding out from your enemy, threshing wheat so that you can have food, provide food for your family and, and maybe for your village. You're afraid at every sound that you hear outside because you don't know if it's the enemy that has located you. And this bright light shines in this place of darkness. You turn around to see that it is a messenger of the Lord. It's clearly not a human being. And this person identifies you as a brave and mighty warrior. And the first thing out of your mouth, as you see an answer to your prayer, is, uh, what have you done for me lately? What do you mean the Lord is with us? Are you kidding me? The, Lo the Lord is with us? Have you been paying attention to what's, what's been going on CNN? 
Fox News? Have you seen the reports? How can you say the Lord is with us? Are, are you not aware that a hurricane has just has toppled our entire neighborhood? How can you say the Lord is with us? L let, me, let me tell you what the Lord has done, Mr. Messenger. The Lord has abandoned us. He has given us up into the hands of our enemies. No, 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 no. The one who freed us from Egyptian oppression? No, 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 no. He ain't here. Wow. Anybody that bold to talk to God face to face like that? Anybody here? Anybody willing? This is a very difficult thing. And I, and I want you to understand this. People don't come to this place just by some careless happenstance. They arrive at this place of such anger and indignation and such distrust because of trauma. This is straight up a trauma response. Instead of falling to his knees and saying, Lord, thank you so much for hearing our cry, like the, like the scripture that we read today from David, I love the Lord. He heard my cry. That was David's response. Gideon is like, I do not like you. I do not trust you. You have abandoned me. You're not with us. Unfortunately, many of our religious experiences, many of our spiritual experiences are filtered through our trauma. If our parents administer justice, punitive justice, in a certain way, sometimes even unfairly, we may determine we see God in the same light. If our parents seem to uh, give us love only if we earned it, we believe we must do the same with God. This happens also as we become adults and we're in relationships and marriages. The trauma from our childhood is lived out and reenacted in some of the most toxic ways. And some of you feel like, I really don't have trauma. It's just dormant trauma, trust me, because it'll get triggered. Stuff you don't think that, that you struggled with when you were younger because the, 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 the childish mind is a brilliant mind. It learns how to deal with unfairness and abuse and lock it away and say, oh, my mind is not mature enough to handle what's going on with me right now. So I'm just going to put this way in a compartment and I'm not going to deal with it right now. But let me tell you, one day that compartment will be reopened and you will deal with it as an adult. For seven years, Gideon has been abused. For seven years, he's been living in fear. For seven years, he doesn't believe that God hears prayers, answers prayers. He doesn't believe that God is for them for seven years. And now that God shows up, it is too late, according to Gideon. And the interesting thing is that sometimes we think with trauma that if we start getting some good things going on in our life, we start receiving some gifts, we start receiving some blessings, it'll somehow make up for all of the trauma we experienced in our past. That's not how it works. You know that, right? That's why people who are rich, wealthy, the one percenters out there, people, people that, 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 that score these big contracts on, on these sports teams, you would think that all of their years of poverty have now been wiped away. No, 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 no. You can see how they live their life, some of the choices that they make, that they're still working through their stuff. Money has not solved their issues. Now they're just a rich person with issues. And this is why it is so important, family, that when we're working as a church to heal people, when we're working as a church uh, uh, sharing the gospel, that we, we can never say to somebody, oh, I know, I know you lost a child, but look on the bright side, you at least still have two. It makes no sense. Well, don't worry, God's going to bless you with another one. We talked about Job last week, and, and God the Bible tells us, blessed him in the, in the latter part of his life. More blessings in the latter part of his life. He had more kids. But let me tell you something. The new kids he had will never replace the kids he lost. Are you hearing me? It doesn't matter if he had 40 kids in the second half of his life. It will never replace the children that he lost. And those of you who know what it's like to lose a child, you know this from experience. No matter how many more children you have, it will never replace the child you lost. That's not how trauma works. 
That's not how wounds and pain and hurts from the past work. Don't worry, I got some sweet stuff, some sugar for you. That doesn't change the bitterness of what I've experienced. And that's why the Bible, Job never says, thank you, Lord, now you've made up for all the pain I went through. No, all he simply says is my eyes are open. I just see now. I see you. So the angel of the Lord is speaking to Gideon, and Gideon says, the Lord is not really with us. I don't know what you're talking about. Verse 14, this is God's response. The Lord turned to him and said, go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? I I don't understand why this happens so often with God. It's just like last week with Job. Job has all these questions. He hurls all these accusations at God, and God never answers his questions, never answers them directly. And here is Gideon saying, Lord, how can you say you're with us? You've abandoned us. You, you, you've neglected us. And God never says, no, Gideon, that's not fair. You know what? Honestly, what happened was he never does this. He just, it's like he takes the abuse. He takes all of the insults, all of the accusations, and just bears it. It's, it's interesting because many of you, if you've been in therapy, special couple, especially couples therapy, you will realize that facts don't really help you in these type of disagreements and relationships. I used to think they did. I, I, I was the kind of person that I would take you to my virtual court. If you were going to tell me I didn't do something well or right, I was going to let you know. I would have receipts, text messages. I would highlight it. I would let you know what we decided on, how we determined it, and that I was at the right place at the right time, and then go, boom, what you gonna say? As if there was a judge and a jury. It doesn't matter. Facts don't matter. What matter is what is the person feeling in the moment. And some of you are going to say, Pastor, I don't want to hear this because this is why I get so, so upset. I don't want to hear about feelings. We need, we need people to be more logical. That's not how human nature works. Have you ever tried being logical with your three-year-old in the toy store about how it's not their birthday, it's not Christmas, or you can't afford that toy? No kid wants to hear that. I remember sometimes Nathan would get into his, like, I call primal brain, and I would try to explain things to him while he's crying. All of it is going over his head. And I'm like, why am I trying to have a conversation with a child that is clearly upset, very emotional, and no amount, no, no amount of facts is going to change his circumstance at this point? This happens often in relationships. But honey, that is not what happened. I didn't show up late. I I just met, I just just showed up at the wrong place. I thought you were going to be there because I looked at the text and you said this. I thought it was this restaurant. I assumed that because that's where we were the last time we went. I didn't know you meant this one. And and it doesn't matter. That person has already been triggered. They've already experienced that you've abandoned them. You didn't show up on time. And you, sh- you showing them the facts that you were there just at the wrong place won't change what they felt for the last hour. And you don't realize that what they're feeling for the last hour isn't just the experience they're having with you, it's the experience they had when they were four, when they were five, when they were eight, when they were 12. Sometimes you are talking to your husband and you're not talking to the 35-year-old. You're talking to the 5-year-old. And you're like, oh, thank you, pastor. That finally makes so much sense. I've been telling him he's so childish. No, 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 I I get it because it feels childish. I get it. But you have to understand how trauma works. The reality is The reality is, is that most of us, when we're in these spaces, don't like feeling the responsibility of a person's emotional pain. We don't like to think it's our fault, but we have to remember this is not about assigning fault. It's about what does it take in this moment to heal. And God doesn't waste his time trying to explain to Gideon, actually Gideon, it's y'all that abandoned me. Y'all pushed me away. Y'all cut me off. 
If you remain in me, I will remain in you. But if you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that withers away. That's not God saying, I'm going to make you wither. I'm telling you what naturally happens when you push me away. I respected your choice. God's not going to go there with Gideon because Gideon would be incapable of hearing it. So what God starts laying down are new pathways. Gideon, go with all of your strength. Go with all of your strength. I am going with you. You will save Israel out of Midian's hand. I am sending you. It's interesting now because now Gideon moves away from his anger towards God and he moves into this other place. And this also happens with trauma. Watch this, watch this. Pardon me, Lord, verse 15. How can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh. My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. Gideon goes from, how dare you? How can you abandon us? And now hearing the words of God as God is now, now kind of laying down these new pathways uh, to, to let Gideon know, I see you, like he did with Job. I see you. I value you. Even in your suffering, I've been watching. I've been listening. I am here for you. And now he goes into this other place of, I am worth nothing. I do not matter. I am not special. I am the least important person. My daughter and I, we went to, we went to this event. And I said, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get some food and I'll, I'll show up at our seats. And she's okay. She goes on to our seats. I get the food. And... I get a text message, are you coming back? I thought she was joking. Are you coming back? She must have been 19 years old. She's been in our home for about three years at this time. Are you coming back? I asked her, are you serious? She said, yes. I'm like, I, I, I paid money for these seats. I just paid money for the food. I told you I was coming back. Why would you think otherwise? Am I, being, am I being logical in this moment? Of course I am. I sit down next to her. I'm like looking at her. Honey, why would you? And she is crying. Because I've triggered something in her. And now she is reliving being abandoned. Not just by her biological parents, but by her former foster parents. And now here comes this new foster parent who would one day be her adoptive parent. Her adoptive parent. And, 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 and I am telling her, trying to reassure her, I had to live for years with the mistakes of father figures before me. And I would argue with her in times like well, sweetie i'm just going to the school and i'm coming back i was a chaplain i'm going to the school i'm going to i will be back i don't i don't like being home in the dark i'm like you're 20 years old how can you be afraid of the dark and then i started reading books so i could understand my daughter the body keeps score anybody ever read that book before wow the broken way oh and I started to understand this is not something that can be dealt with with facts and logic. I had to look my daughter in the eyes and tears. I said, sweetie, never again am I going to fight you on this. If you tell me you're hurting, I'm in there with you. If you tell me that I've left you and I abandoned you, I mean, I, I got an Apple Watch just so I could always respond to her messages. If I didn't respond quick enough, she'd say, why are you ignoring me? I'm like, sweetie, I've been in meetings all day. And some of you are going to say, pastor, you're training her the wrong way. You need to set her straight. I tried it that way. It only made it worse. So every time she would come with something negative, I would always say, oh, sweetie, I love hearing from you. Just redirect it. I love hearing from you. Oh, you, every, time you, every time you text, my heart leaps. I love you. You're my daughter. I'm so proud of you. I'm so glad you're in my life. 
And it's hard for a person to stay focused on this, on this path of abandonment when they're hearing what they've always needed to hear and be reassured of. And God does that. Gideon is just, he's living out his trauma. You've abandoned me. How can you say I'm special? How can you say I'm strong? I'm the weakest. I'm a nobody. I'm the least of the least. And he says, oh, you're strong. You're brave. You're mighty. You're my son. You're beautiful. I'm the least, and the Lord answered in verse 16, I will be with you, and I will strike down all the Midianites. I'm with you, man. We got this together. When Jesus was baptized, he heard these words, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. We don't know this might have been the first time Christ heard a physical voice, an audible voice. This is my son in whom I am well pleased. Can you imagine Jesus hearing his father's voice? Daddy, oh my you, oh my you. Yes. And then immediately the Bible says the spirit leads him into the wilderness. Matthew chapter 4. Leads him into the wilderness to be tested for 40 days and 40 nights. 40 days and 40 nights, no cell phone reception. No food, no water, no friends, no family. Cut off seemingly for 40 days and 40 nights. And then the tempter shows up at the end of this ordeal. The tempter shows up when Jesus is at his weakest and most vulnerable and most fragile. And he asks him a question. If you are the son of God, you can do this, right? You can turn these rocks into bread. Feed yourself. Everyone thinks this is a temptation about appetite. Everyone who reads this says, yes, this is the the strongest temptation out there, appetite. It was the same issue with Adam and Eve, appetite. I'm not going to say that there was no element of appetite, that Christ wasn't hungry. I'm not going to say that Adam and Eve didn't think the fruit of knowledge of good and evil didn't look good and desirable for food. But you have to understand something. There's something deeper there. He says, if you are the son of God. Just like, just like, just like. When the serpent told Adam and Eve, you're not like God. If you eat this fruit, you will be. But if you don't, you're not like him. This is the part where most of us fall. We don't know our value. We don't know who we are. And when we've gone through traumatic situations, it always causes us to doubt our value and our worth. This is what makes trauma live in our life. This is what festers it. This is why it can't go away so many times because we're constantly wondering who we are, whose we belong to. I talked a little bit about middle child syndrome. That thing was real for me. I pastored from a place of middle child syndrome. I had to be a pleaser. I couldn't, I didn't want anyone to be disappointed. I became so codependent. I would show up for every event. I would be there for any situation. I remember one couple needed counseling, but they said, Pastor, we just don't have any time in our schedule. We just can't do it. But if you can show up at five in the morning before we go to work, we can do it. And I showed up. I would never do that again. Don't even ask. But that middle child syndrome thing, just it just exploded. I would, I would finish with a sermon. I would think, I was terrible. I was awful. I didn't do enough. I wasn't good enough. What God has had to do to repair, let me tell you, I couldn't be your pastor if this stuff didn't get fixed. I was going to leave ministry altogether because it was too much brokenness. But God began to repair. Some of it in therapy. Some of it just simply awareness, finally seeing what the source was. Some of it is is having to rewire, tell yourself the correct and accurate narrative. You're not good enough. No, no, I'm his beloved, and he's pleased with me. I haven't done enough. God has done enough. You don't need to overwork in this space. I am going to be with you. I am going to be with you. I have chosen you. I have called you. I say you're brave and mighty. Go with all your strength. If you are the son of God, if you are the son of God, and Jesus says, oh, man shall not live by bread alone. It's not what you say. It's what my father says. 
Oh, but, but if, if you throw yourself over, off the top of this temple, the angels will spare you and prove that you're the son of God. No, 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 no. That's not even what they think. They don't even have to think I'm the son of God for me to know that I'm the son of God. Oh, but I'll give you all of this, the kingdoms. You can't say you're the son of God without having possessions, without having kingdoms that you can rule. It's not what I have that makes me who I am. My dad told me I'm his son. It's good enough for me. Gideon, you are one of one. You're not the least. You're not the worst. You're strong. You're brave. You're mighty. And I need you to know that. He says that to you today. You don't have to live as that four or five-year-old that was powerless. When no one was there to protect you there was a God that was there. And that God right now is speaking to you, telling you, I have not left you, and I will never leave you. You are good enough for me, and I want to be good enough for you, brave and mighty warrior. Go with all your strength, and you will defeat the enemy. Oh, but they're, they're innumerable. They, nobody can overcome them. They're like locusts. My pain, my trauma, it's just too deep. It's too great. I am sending you, and I'm going with you, and we will win together. There's someone here today. You want to overcome this trauma. It may happen through therapy over time. But it won't happen if it doesn't start now with you first hearing what God has to say about you. There's someone here today that needs to hear these words. So that when you get into that disagreement with your spouse, you're not triggered all the way back to when you were 12 and 13. That you'll realize that even disagreements doesn't mean you're about to be cast off somewhere. No, no, no. I know that I'm loved. I know my God hasn't abandoned me. I know that I'm special. Even if I was born in the middle, God knows my name. I am one that's who you are today, I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet as we pray. The story of Gideon's not over. We have much more to share. This is just the beginning. You are one of one. I am the least. No, no, you're not. Father, you see those who are standing. Thank you so much for the challenge today opening our eyes to see the situation as it is. We've been reenacting our trauma, our pain, our disappointments that, that go years, decades back. For Gideon, it had been over the last seven years, but we thank you so much for how you redirected him because the way you redirected him is the way that you are redirecting us. I'm a nobody. Oh, you're a somebody. I'm of no value. Oh, you are of such great value. Nobody knows my name. I know your name. Even the hairs on your head, I have numbered. Thank you, Father, for reminding us that we are one of one. The trauma in our life is not an indication of how you care about us or don't care about us just a reflection of how broken this world is. But you are willing to put the pieces back together. And we're willing to start now. Remind us of who we are in you. Are you not sending us? Are you not with us? Thank you. May the healing begin in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated, church family. God bless you this week. Continue to pray for our families that are camping. 
Continue to remind yourself that you are one of one. For God so loved you, you are his beloved. God bless you.